Hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. My name is Nimit. I'm joined with Shanna. Hi, Nimit. Hi, Shanna. How are you doing? I'm good today. Thank you. Well, I'm excited for today's topic because today's topic is around men's health. We're going to be talking about prostate and testicular cancer, particularly. You know, I think men in general are are not the best in taking care of their own <laughs> health, so I think it's a good topic to talk about. And we have Dr. Mahmoud here, who is specialist in in these topics. Shanna, do you want to introduce him? Yes. We have with us today Dr. Syed Mahmoud. He is a oncology and hematology physician. He's the medical director at the Aquilino Cancer Center, and he's also based with Maryland Oncology Hematology. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Mahmoud. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, th- you said it. Men don't always take care of themselves. Absolutely. I think men's health in general, I feel like they don't go to the doctors as much or they don't, you know, proceed for their yearly physicals. I know my family is similar in some of those places as well and doing the yearly checkups. How important is it to get their yearly physical and what are some of the questions they should be asking when they do go to their providers? You know, it's it's a pleasure to be here in the month of September and for Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And I mean, this is a common issue. I mean, I can speak for myself and for my own family, men in general, it's, it's a common generalization, but no one likes to go to the doctor. Just taking the time. I think that the key things for men's health is trying to think about, well, what can I do to prevent issues from coming up? Preventative health is a key thing here. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot that we can do to live a good lifestyle, healthy lifestyle and um, prevent issues from coming. Oh, great. Is there a particular screening for prostate cancer um, that men should be looking for? And what are some of the guidelines in today's world? Yeah, so prostate cancer screening, um, a little bit of a controversial topic. When we talk about screening, it's um, you have to understand that the goal of screening at a population level is to do a measure that's cheap, um, that can identify cancer early, and the goal is to prevent deaths. And unfortunately for prostate cancer screening, the data is somewhat mixed. And that is why from the United States Preventative Services Task Force, they do not have a strong recommendation on one way or the other regarding prostate cancer screening. And they actually say they leave it up to the patient and the doctor to talk about the risk and benefits of this. And that's because there's two large trials showing that the data is mixed. Yes, screening we know can identify cancer sooner. The key thing is is by identifying cancer sooner, are we really making a difference in preventing death? What comes with that is sometimes over-diagnosis and over-treatment. The American Cancer Society actually comes down a bit stronger on this. They generally do for cancer screening. And their general recommendations for um, prostate cancer screening is for the average risk men as starting at the age of 50 to have a conversation with their doctor and, and to consider screening. And screening for prostate cancer is either with the PSA test and or the prostate exam, digital rectal exam. Um, And you consider doing that every two years, average age, um, starting at the age of 50. Now, when you think about risk factors, um, there are people who are at higher risk that you may want to consider starting sooner. And and that is anyone with the first degree relative. That means for most men, their brother or father, that if they had a diagnosis of prostate cancer before the age of 65, that's considered a high risk. Unfortunately, African-American men are also considered at high risk. So for those high-risk individuals, we consider screening starting at the age of 45. And in particular, the screening recommendations from the American Cancer Society go down earlier to the age of 40 if you had two greater, basically two or greater first-degree relatives with a history of prostate cancer or you have a one of these what we call hereditary cancer syndromes or have a mutation you were born with that puts you at high risk for getting prostate cancer. Absolutely. And I think there's there's so many different scenarios of, of where your health could be and what are risk factors that you're involved with. I think to our earlier conversation is that's why it's so important to you know have that conversation with your physician and provider and talk to them about, you know, am I in one of those risk factors or am I okay? Do I need to get these testing or screening? Am I one of those people that I need to, you know, look for these symptoms and what what risk factors are associated with it. So I think it's, it's very important. Now, are these similar for testicular cancer as well? So I would say testicular cancer is very different. Uh, there are rare genetic, let's say, syndromes that are associated with higher risk of testicular cancer. It's very rare. One, for example, is something called Klinefelter syndrome. But as is the case with even prostate cancer, the vast majority of people who develop testicular cancer or prostate cancer, it's someone who doesn't have a family history. So for 
testicular cancer, there is no effective screening study or a screening modality for testicular cancer. It's all about identifying signs and symptoms, getting checked out early. You know, the key thing about testicular cancer is this generally happens in young men, whereas it's a rare cancer in general, less than 1% of solid tumors are testicular cancers. However, it's the most common solid tumor diagnosis in men between the ages of 20 and 34. Wow, I was gonna say, I didn't know that. that yeah, yeah, that so, it's a, you know, these are the- younger. That's right, this is the age where men don't expect to get anything. And the key thing is that it presents generally as either a painless lump or a painful lump in the testes. And most people chalk it up at, at that age. You're like, you don't expect any issue. You think you got injured. You think, oh, it's some infection. It's going to go away. But that is where something, if, if something is present, just get it checked out by the doctor. It is one of the most curable cancers out there. Risk of death is actually quite low if you get it checked out and treated effectively. And treatment is very effective. But the key thing is identification. That's, that's where we lose out and where we may delay in diagnosis and delay getting things checked out is when you just ignore it or decide that it's something else on your own accord and don't get it checked out by the doctor. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really good to know that, you know, when people hear cancer, they're, you know, related to not curable or, you know, fatal in, in some cases, but it's good to know that, you know, this is not fatal and very curable in early stages and identification is the key. What are some of the myths around testicular cancer? Testicular cancer for a long time, even when I was growing up, I remember that, okay, if you get repetitive trauma, bike riding, horseback riding, you know, repetitive trauma was thought to be associated in increased risk for testicular cancer. And that's just not the case. That hasn't been proven. The data has not borne that out. The main risk factors for testicular cancer is really undescended testes. It's also called crypto orchidism. That's usually identified at birth. And by the age of one, most testes should descend down into the scrotum. And if that's usually picked up by the pediatrician, it gets surgically corrected. That's the highest risk for testicular cancer outside of the genetic cancer syndrome that we uh, talked about. The only other main risk factor is if you've had one before, then you're at higher risk for getting another one. And in general, if you look at race, uh, Caucasian white individuals, men are at four to five times higher risk just by pure rates alone compared to other ethnic groups. So that's that's just something to know. So you mentioned yeah. testicular cancer being pretty rare. What about prostate cancer for yeah. men? Prostate cancer is actually one of the most common cancers in men. It's actually the leading most common cancer outside of skin cancer for men. And it's the second leading cancer cause of death in men in the United States. So it's quite common. Whereas, you know, you have about 10,000 new cases of uh, testicular cancer a year in the United States. Prostate cancer, you're talking about 270,000 cases yeah. per year. Wow. And so it's quite common. One in eight men are going to be diagnosed in their lifetime. Well, the same as breast cancer for women. Exactly. Yeah. So for women, breast cancer is the most common. And for men, it's prostate cancer. Whereas one in 41 men will actually die from prostate cancer. So it's not that high risk of death, but it, it is very common. And the key thing that we're learning about nowadays is that there is a strong, there is a strong genetic link to prostate cancer. If you think about your own family history, you think about how many people in your family have a cancer history and it's quite common. And we now know we're doing much better at testing for gene mutations, identifying mutations that people are born with that are associated with cancer, not only prostate cancer, but other cancers. And the cost of testing has gone down quite a bit. Yeah. At most, if you have a, enough family history, your insurance will cover testing. The availability of genetic counselors to do this for you, to kind of go through your family history and identify things, it's much more prevalent and available. I'm part of a practice that we have several people that can do genetic counseling for you. And the out-of-pocket costs, even if your insurance for whatever reason doesn't pay for it, the out-of-pocket cost for broad testing is somewhere around $200 or so. So wow. it's quite affordable compared yeah. to even just like 10, 15 years ago. So just identifying that, not only could it help you, it could help other people in your family and prevention is the key thing here. And maybe there are things you can do to even prevent cancer from developing, especially in breast cancer and ovarian cancer and things like that. So we've talked about that on this podcast. It seems to be a recurring theme is prevention and just knowing your body, knowing what's going on and developing a relationship with your physician to talk about that. And you said prostate cancer, it's a little, it's kind of mixed on what to do. What's not mixed is just knowing your doctor and finding one and having those conversations. Um, same thing for women. That's a, that's a recurring theme here. And we've talked a little bit too about having that conversation with your family and knowing your yeah. history that yeah, it's not the most pleasant thing to talk about, but it's important to 
just be aware of what's in your background, what's what's going on with your family. I think the tide will shift. You know, I came from a culture and a background where people didn't talk about mm-hmm. other family members' health, right? They kept it all hush-hush or secret or personal. And that's fair, but knowing your family history can make a big difference to your own health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are some myths around prostate cancer? You talked about a little for testicular cancer. What about for a prostate? Yeah, I think there, in terms of risk factors, you know, some myths were that there's data really that's inconclusive regarding vasectomies. So there is, I know there's a lot of information out there that vasectomies can increase your risk for prostate cancer that has not been proven out. STDs causing or putting at you at high risk for prostate cancer, the data has not been proven out. Um, The only thought around that was that if there was some chronic inflammation of the prostate, we do think that chronic inflammation can be an increased risk for cancer in general, and that those vasectomies and SCDs can cause inflammation around the area. But again, specifically for those, the data is very inconclusive. And I would say that those are myths Mm. in terms of prostate cancer. Other things generally, yes, living or uh, eating a good diet, having good weight control, exercise, smoking. These for prostate cancer are not clearly linked, but these are general good health, right? You you want to do, you you want to eat healthy, you want to have good weight goals and you want to um, not smoke. So all those things are good in general. So I I strongly recommend those for anybody, but specifically linked to prostate cancer, it's it's really not that strong yet. As I've reached 40 and gone over 40, (laughs) my husband too. And I just find myself thinking about these things. Didn't think about them five years ago, you know, probably, but as I've gotten older, I just tend to think about my health more and I try to push myself and push my husband too, to kind of be like, okay, we've been sitting on the couch for too long (laughs) or, you know, just eating healthier. That's good advice. Yeah. I think that's one of the other common themes we're seeing over the past few podcasts as well. You know, just normal health in general, preventative measures um, is is highly beneficial and goes long ways, regardless of which disease processes or, you know, issues we're talking about. Um, Even though, as you said, it's not directly linked overall in general health for, for both men and women, it's, it's highly beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. In terms of treatment for both of them, I, you've mentioned a little bit that there's testicular cancer, one of the most curable is prostate. I know they've made a lot of advances in treatment in general, just for cancer. Is it still earlier you catch it, the better your options are and survival rates? I would say in general, you want to catch it early, mm-hmm. right? No one wants to catch a cancer late. Again, in terms of the screening and identifying, the data is mixed on if it will actually make you live longer. So so the vast majority of men, if you look at autopsy series, there's prostate cancer in men. Most men live and die with prostate cancer and they don't even know it. Oh. You know, it, It's something that's slow growing. It may mm. be there. It's, it's part of the human existence. Mm. The question is, we don't know which ones are going to be the bad players and actually shorten people's lives. We don't know that. So yes, we can identify cancer early, but then that causes sometimes overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Mm. So it's really a discussion with your doctor for how I view it personally, mm-hmm. you know, because it's easy to say, talk to your doctor. Well, what, where's the nuances here, right? You know, I personally feel that if you have a family history, it's kind of a no-brainer to have that discussion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then because that family history proves that whether it's biologic, whether it's environmental, someone in your family, you, there is some predisposition yeah. or there's some genetic predisposition, whatever you want to call it. And and that's where I get concerned when I look at, you know, I see people in clinic all the time and they're having this diagnosis and then you, then you see, oh, there's multiple family members. And that's the person you think, could there have been an intervention to catch it early? I would say, advancements and treatments are vast. You know, before there was a kind of very intensive surgery that most people do. Now it's all robotic. Recovery time is is excellent. Surgery is one of the mainstays, but you don't need surgery. Many prostate cancers are found early. You can watch prostate cancer. Like I said- I've heard that term, watchful waiting. Exactly, yep. exactly. Because- Again, this is generally a slow growing. That's usually we use that for the lower grade prostate cancers that prove that they're slow growing cancers. But radiation therapy, what we call brachytherapy, which is implanting these radiation seeds into the prostate that doesn't require surgery. And then later on down the line of the cancer journey, you may be talking about hormonal therapy and chemotherapy. And and there's big pushes now in terms of diagnosis and imaging modalities for prostate cancer that are really advancing. That's wonderful. That's good to hear that, yeah, that things are, are moving forward and becoming more advanced. And so maybe that'll encourage people to continue to keep up with their health and catch it early so that they have a lot of options. Mm-hmm. As a final say, what do you think we should have? Like, what do you 
one takeaway for men to keep up with their health? Go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, we haven't I, said that enough today. <laughs> no, I know because it, it, it is a re- honestly, it is a recurring theme. If you talk to any doctor that treats a lot of people, it's a recurring theme. There's usually a couple that comes in and someone's dragging the other person in on both sides. Okay, it happens <laughs> on both sides. But yes, it's commonly the men being dragged in and the people who ignore things are usually in the worst shape and. Yes, if you catch, if you, there's a problem that can't be explained, something with your health, do not put your head in the sand. Go see the doctor. I tell some of my patients, you know, you, I give them permission to poke you, poke them with a sharp stick to get them to the doctor, okay? <laughs> because, you know, if, if, if there's an issue, they need to get checked out. Especially with the last couple of years with COVID, a lot of people, rightfully so, concerned about going into the doctor, go, concerned about being around other sick people. Yeah. And that has led to delays in diagnosis and later presentations. And and we've seen that just in the last couple of years in our own clinic, you know, let alone nationally. So yeah. that I think is the big deal. And just to take another point, especially for colon cancer, I'm just putting aside, you know, cancer rates are becoming higher for younger people. And just because you're young, don't expect medical issues can't come up. And that's just something that we need to all be aware of. Yeah, we've we've heard that actually on some past episodes, even around heart disease in women, it's, it's occurring younger. Colorectal cancer, we heard today, testicular cancer is more common in younger men. Yeah. So no matter your age, pay attention to your health, know your body, find a doctor that you can connect with and have a relationship with. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all this great information. Nimit, any final thoughts? Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, to come here and help us with elaborate on prostate cancer and testicular cancer for our listeners. You're welcome. My pleasure. And thank you to our listeners. Don't forget to like or subscribe for new episodes at either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you do want to learn more about Dr. Mahmoud and his practice, you can go to MarylandOncology.com for more about Adventist Healthcare. You can go to AdventistHealthcare.com. Thanks. 